Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are around the world. Welcome back to the Done Deal Show. I'm joined as ever by the brilliant Ben Jacobs. How are you, my friend? Very good. It would have been better if my first game at Chelsea hadn't resulted in a 1-1 draw with Salzburg. That's just a little dig there at those in the chat that already will be comparing me to Graham Potter. So I'm preempting your gag by owning up to the fact that I do double up as the Chelsea manager. But no, I'm good. Window shut, but the news continues, doesn't it? And I think that it's going to be a really interesting time now leading up to the World Cup and seeing how a number of the British sides in particular that have started in quite wobbly ways, particularly Chelsea and Liverpool, react over the coming weeks. Yeah, it's it's certainly going to be interesting, as you say. I mean, the the, the breaking games are kind of weird. I say weird breaking games. It's like some are going ahead, some are not, with obviously everything going on around Queen Elizabeth's funeral. Kind of, it, it throws some spanners into the work. The teams will fall behind, but it does give some managers maybe more time on the training ground to work with their teams. Um, it's kind of, and it sort of slowed the news cycle down massively. Having no games over the weekend, it was almost, there was no fallout after results etc and i even feel like the news and i'm not sure if you've been even been briefed on this i feel like for a good two or three days people were just not releasing news maybe out of respect if that made sense it just felt very you, you saw it in boxing where they anthony joshua and tyson fury agreed their fight on the friday but they didn't even talk about it until tuesday just out of respect so it kind of feels like a really weird time in sport at the moment um but like almost like yesterday last couple of days kind of lit a torch paper again and we're kind of back to uh, delving into things in 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 more detail um and viewers we are going to be speaking about some some potential transfers today noises are trending you know does Casado want to move to Chelsea is what's going around today we're going to look at Mudric to Arsenal he spoke about a desire maybe to join the Premier League but we're going to get the inside track on that we're going to talk Jim Ratcliffe and his Man United bid is it on and we are going to look at Graham Potter and Todd Bowley of course the all-star game uh, and a few bits and pieces surrounding that. Any questions you've got for Ben, make sure you put them in. We always prioritise our super chats and our member chats as best we can. Um, and I, I did want to start with Chelsea, really, uh, with, with you, Ben, because it's been um, a, a crazy two weeks. You know, two cool gone, Potter in, all-star all star games, the likes of Casado, uh, Casado and more being linked, talks of new directors of football. Uh, a report that came out yesterday is that if, if Campos comes in, They'd be willing to give him, and I'm sure any sporting director, and a further £260 million over the next two windows. Um, lots to discuss around Chelsea. What yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think let's start with the sporting director, which is going to be a key indicator of the direction that Chelsea are heading. And as I exclusively reported a few days back, the kind of mystery name that is in very advanced talks is, ironically, given last night, Salzburg's sporting director Christoph Freund and the reason for that as Todd Bowley has hinted when speaking at a conference in New York is because he's a big fan of the Red Bull model and this is the first real indicator I think of the sustainable part of Chelsea Football Club so as I've said many times Chelsea were surprised by the lack of data that they inherited and equally bemused by the structure at which the data that they do have is filtered throughout the entire club, particularly that relationship between the academy and the first team. And then Chelsea have always had kind of relatively formal relationships with certain clubs like Vitesse, where they can loan out players. And there's a history of them being utilised through Amando Broya, for example, and Mason Mount as well. But what Bowley wants to do is build a model from the academy up and why do I say sustainable? Because when you do that, you have two opportunities to win. The first is that you get talent young and at decent value and they become superstars in the first team. And you need to create clear pathways to do that. And then the second win is if things don't work out, you usually have sell on value. And in order to provide that structure, I think Bowley looks at Red Bull and says, what if we either formalized more arrangements with global clubs like the City Group, or we even bought other clubs? And I know that they're looking in both Portugal and Brazil in the long term. And then suddenly Chelsea becomes part of a group or a model. And in doing so, I think that Bowley thinks that that will allow Chelsea to modernize and compete with the City Group. And then yeah. ironically, within that model, 
they'll take the framework of the City group, but then the mentality of Liverpool's recruitment model. And he sees that as the best of both worlds because Liverpool are data-led, they're sustainable, it's decision by numbers of which the coach is only one part. So then if he leaves, however much autonomy he or she had, there is still that protection for the club. And that, I think, is why even though Carl McCauley has come in, they want to bring in a sporting director and possibly a technical director to make sure that if for any reason, however long Potter stays for, he changes for any eventuality, they're not then having to build the model once again from scratch. And that is just very sensible. And Freund has had advanced talks with Chelsea. He refused to rule out moving. He said that Chelsea is a huge club. It's in transition. The talks started when Chelsea inquired about Benjamin Sesko, even though they were not successful in getting that particular player. And Bowley wants a sporting director, ideally, that is used to working within a model. So there are other candidates. Paul Mitchell is one of them at Monaco. He's very intent on taking the role. But Freund is more data-driven and has worked within that Red Bull group. And then Campos is a bit of a red herring because contractually, even though he's technically freelance, he cannot work for PSG and Chelsea simultaneously. So he would either have to buy himself out of his PSG yeah. contract to advise Chelsea or who knows, potentially be their new sporting director if they don't agree a deal with Freund or Alternatively, he would have to try and somehow convince PSG that his role, if he was to only advise Chelsea, would not impinge upon his day-to-day -day at PSG. And my understanding from PSG is they feel this is all just Campos PR, the same with Manchester United and the links there. It's all about him getting in the media. They're not very happy about it. And PSG feel that Campos is going nowhere. And if they are to be believed and Campos is going nowhere then contractually, he will not be allowed to join Chelsea in any capacity. So it's quite problematic. It's certainly true that Boley has spoken to Campos as well, and it's important to keep stressing with the sporting director that there are multiple candidates. But right now, I would say that Freund is the most advanced. Freund is leading the race. He is the favourite at this point. And the fact that he said, who knows what will happen in the coming, and here's the key phrase, weeks or months. Weeks is a very strange phrase or word to use because it suggests that something is more imminent and close. Now, this was said to Sky Sports Austria, things can be lost in translation, but it tallies with what I reported a couple of days ago that Chelsea had been working on one name quite secretly. They wanted to keep it under wraps. That name is Freund. And it's far more advanced than people realise. So let's see what happens over the coming weeks. Graham Potter and Carl McCauley still need to sign off on the sporting director. And Potter will speak to Freund and possibly some of the other candidates as well over the next 48 hours or so. And then Chelsea hope to lock in a candidate and make a final decision. And then the only advantage of Campos is that he could still come in with Freund or if he was to be sporting director over two windows it might give Chelsea the opportunity to still wait for Michael Edwards, who was their original number one choice. So they're working fast. They're looking to get a name locked in over the coming weeks, certainly by the end of the month. And then it's a case of waiting out things like gardening leave and any contractual commitments that stop whoever the successful candidate is coming in immediately. But come what may, Chelsea will have a sporting director in place ready for the January transfer window. And you know what? Listening to what you've said there is quite interesting, B, and also like reading some of the comments at the same time, which I like to do. Um, I think the Campos situation, what was really interesting is when you read the stories, and I've, obviously I've seen your, your tweets and your exclusives, that there is the potential for multiple people to potentially come into Chelsea and help run. Whoever the you know, a sporting director, it could, it could be that Paul Mitchell might be, as you've mentioned, might work underneath um, uh, Chris, uh, Christoph. And I think what's interesting about that is I, I saw people on Twitter say, no. He wouldn't work under him. They all they all do the same job. I'm like, if you pay someone enough money, they'll take a quote unquote more junior role as long as the money's right and they you know a, a certain amount of responsibility is delegated to them. And I kind of feel like there's a comment here that came through from Twisted, uh, one of our viewers, and he kind of said that uh, it took nearly a decade for FSG's model to take effect. And I think mm -hmm. people are, I, I, and it did, but history shows us that 
you can piggyback a lot upon other people's method methodology and get to a, a a cleaner quicker result faster because the SFGs of this world, the Man Cities of this world, they've laid down the pathway. They've shown you what works and what doesn't. So you don't have to make those those same those same mistakes as it were. You know, if people, you know, if suddenly a new billionaire wants to start a, a space program, like the likes of, like, it, it, it took Elon Musk a lot quicker to, get, to create a space program than it did NASA. That's because they've got all the data that NASA created to piggyback on to get to that stage faster. And I think that people have got to understand that. And I see a lot of disrespect towards Todd Bowley. Maybe it's because he's American. Maybe it's because he speaks a little bit too much to the media and kind of airs the, the dirty linen in public, as it were, and, and shares those those views. And some of them are seen as radical. The the, the all stars game thing has, has triggered people. And all I saw yesterday was basically no more Americanisms in our sport. And I just thought sponsors on shirts, boxes at stadiums. I mean, Gary Neville calling out Americanisms where he's most he's signed to show is literally called Monday Night Football. I just find the whole thing to be ironic. We've taken games away from three o'clock on Saturdays and spread them over the course of from Fridays through till Monday nights to televise and make more money, which is an Americanism. It wasn't an English idea. It goes against all the traditions of our sport. You know, we took we got rid of back passing. We, we, we added yellow cards to games as examples. We brought in VAR and technology along those lines. We've done so many things in football, which are adaptations of our original game. I do find the way Todd Bowley's being treated really distasteful and disrespectful almost lumping every american and every american owner into one group saying you're all bad for our game you're terrible for our game and i just think to myself mike ashley wasn't bloody english uh, sorry wasn't 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 american you know the, the the owners the owner that absolutely destroyed and nearly bankrupted and put Leighton orient out of business you know was sold by an, an english group to, I believe, an Italian group who ruined the club. What's that got to do with America? So, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of, I mean, there are people that can't stand Salford, Salford, Salford um, City, Salford City, Salford FC, whatever they're called, um, because of the way they've had money pumped into. And they think that's uh, detrimental to the lower, lower pyramids of the game. Uh, so I just find, I don't know, the Todd Bowley kind of abuse and, 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 and attacks at the minute, I find strange. He's clearly trying to build a sustainable long-term plan for the club bringing in some of the best footballing and technical directors in the world. They're spending big money on players, both for the here and now, i.e. Koulibaly's, et cetera, Raheem Sterling's. They're investing in, in, in players for the future. And they're essentially three to four months into this complete transition. And everyone's moaning that it's not where FSG are now or it isn't where Man City are, and therefore it's never going to work. It's a very strange time. And I don't I don't like defending my rival clubs, but I just, yeah, I just find the whole thing towards Todd Bowley very distasteful, very distasteful. Yeah, I think that in a nutshell, you nailed it when you referred to the fact that Todd Bowley has spoken quite a bit, and that's very rare for an owner. And he's going to be more in the media glare because he's not just a minority owner. He's also the face of the American consortium. He's the chairman and he's the sporting director. And um, we don't hear from Newcastle's majority owner, from Manchester City's owner, from the Glazers. And it was the case with Abramovich as well, that he was a very anonymous owner as far as talking about the football club in the media. And I think that it's very refreshing that Todd Bowley is prepared to talk. There's a question as to where and when he should talk and in what capacity, because he's got so many roles. Is he speaking as sporting director when referring to Thomas Tuchel and himself having different ideologies or does that come from the chairman or does that come from the majority owner, Clear Lake Capital? And lines are blurred a little bit because Chelsea is still building their structure. And then was it right to speak at a conference in New York out the blue in such detail versus doing a club interview or engaging with the fans? But in essence, I think it's refreshing to see any owner this open and transparent, whether you agree with Bowley or not. And it boils down to one key point, which... I've seen in the chat as well. Bowley is, to some, talking too much. I think there's going to be a tweet, by the way, of Bowley handshake Ben Jacobs talks too much. And then that, in a nutshell, tells you that some people just don't like context. They don't like detail and they don't like the threat of change. And I think that sort of sets up this whole triggering around the all-star game. And my opinion on it is this, that 
no idea is a bad idea as long as there is consultation. And putting out that idea should not be caricatured or ridiculed. And I don't see it as arrogant. Ultimately, the new ownership group have spent around 2.5 billion up front and promised further investment, meaning that the total sale of Chelsea is around 4.25 billion. And in paying that and taking over the club, why are they not entitled to talk about their club and to put new ideas forwards and to see an owner with a different perspective trying to get the Premier League to work more collaboratively in a way that financially will dribble down the pyramid and benefit everybody seems to me like a very sensible point. And with the All-Star game, let's not forget that he was suggesting it because the financials in baseball show that they can make 200 million. And that's a key point here that's being missed. Everyone's saying All-Star game, it's terrible. But what Bowley actually said is that the All-Star game in baseball creates $200 million. So can we maximize an idea like that in football to generate more income? And I think that that makes those comments a bit more level-headed. Yeah. Not everything yeah. was perfect. For example, the Mo Salah being part of the Chelsea Academy and the same with Kevin De Bruyne was unfortunately an error. And in doing so, his credibility takes a hit. But I think it's also very important here that we're not kind of xenophobic and that we don't group all Americans as bad for football. Gary Neville spoke of American investment being a threat. And that's too general because there's a variety of different owners that need to be more transparent, that are arguably a threat to football because we don't know how they operate. And that is why the independent regulator is going to be so key. And so is fan feedback. But specifically with the All-Star game, it's ultimately a suggestion. And if Bowley wants to table it, people will disagree with it. And it is very American. But there's parts of American sport that could be very beneficial towards all UK sport, especially around how they generate funding and fan engagement. Where I think we don't want to over-Americanize is with the timeouts, with the advertising in games, with the lack of promotion or, as they call it, demotion. We certainly don't want to move towards a closed model as per the European Super League. And there's a worry, I suppose, amongst some because Chelsea were one of the clubs that issued the original statement saying that they wanted to join that. So now if they've got an American owner, is he franchise-led? Because that is ultimately what the Dodgers are. So these are concerns and I empathise with those concerns. But let's make no mistake that Bowley saying he wants an all-star game doesn't mean there's going to be an all-star game. It just means that at some point down the line, there might be further consultation. And if it gets shot down by all of the other clubs, then it won't happen. And remember, too, that Bowley's not the first to say this. In 2011, I think, Rio Ferdinand was watching the baseball all-star game and tweeted that he thinks it's a good idea. So I think that it's yeah. great that we're even talking about this, even if we're ridiculing it, even if we're shouting it down, even if some are saying that it's arrogant. It's great that we're talking about it because it's an owner that actually has the control to change Chelsea and the Premier League dynamic and get us away from this kind of big six and more to ideas that might benefit all 20 clubs and the EFL as well. And the fact that just one quip gets us talking about it is so refreshing compared to PIF's majority owner not speaking, as having no idea what the plans for the Glazers yeah. or Manchester City's owners are. So specifically, I think it's one of those ideas that need shaping. And how do we make sure it's not gimmicky? And what are the financials behind it? And would it work here for the Premier League? But what I would say is that we have the Community Shield, we have Soccer Aid, and those are kind of loved. And they're two very extremes because the Community Shield borders on a season curtain raiser and has a trophy that is now accepted, however much credence you put on it. And Soccer Aid is kind of now influencer-led and the All-Star game is kind of somewhere between. But don't think about it in terms of, well, could it be scheduled and when? Or where would you draw the line between North and South? Look at it more as if, and it's a massive if, there was consultation and it ever developed, what would be the benefit to the Premier League and below? And then if it is financially beneficial, there would be TV partners, there would be interest. And what else is around it? Are we going to do an awards around it? And some will say that's too American. But I just think 
why not explore it? If you're triggered by an all-star game, then you're living a very kind of angry life because it's not impacting on the Premier League season. Let somebody pitch it and it'll either get laughed out of the room or it will get developed, but put it on paper first rather than just getting crazy angry about it now and well, saying is- the owner of Chelsea can't talk about it. Well, this is the thing, though, Ben. Like again, I, I kind of I understand when people say, "Oh, how would it work? What what did the logistics look like?" And I'm like, "That's a fair question," but they just look at it as a base idea. And I saw Jurgen Klopp laugh it out the room. And the reason why, if I was a manager right now or a club owner, I would be keeping my mouth firmly shut is because if, for instance, um, the Sultan of Brunei or one of, one of an, an Emirate of Dubai. Or Jeff Bezos wakes up tomorrow morning, morning, morning and says, I want to create the, the Amazon Prime all-star game. And he turns around and says, it's worth, I'm just making a number up here, every club who has a player involved will get paid £80 million direct cash. Um, and what we'll also do is make sure there's £150 million that gets trickled down the, the UK pyramid. Every single owner in this country is signing up to it. £80 million. And I'm not saying they'll throw that much into it, but... I'm just putting it out there. A company like Amazon could throw 800 million pound at a game like that and and not even bat an eyelid. They make that much money. It would also, whether people like it or not, and every every single football fan going, it's nonsense. If this game happens, you are watching. And that's the point. And it's a bit like with the Super League. I didn't like the only part of the Super League I thought was wrong was the lack of jeopardy. The, The fact that you couldn't get into it. It was a closed shop. The idea in itself, I didn't think was necessarily bad. I think it needed ad- 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 adapting, but the idea was there. But after a couple of days of being angry, the one thing I said is this. Would I stop, re- if, if the Super League went ahead, would I not do match reactions to it? Would I not report on news surrounding it? The answer was no, I'd still cover it. Therefore, I'm not going to hypocrisize myself and moan about it. So when I see people saying, oh, this goes against the traditions of football, well, I, I do hope you don't watch Super Sunday games. I do hope you don't watch Friday night games. I hope you don't watch... Saturday lunchtime kickoff, because if you're going to go back to the traditions and origin of football, that all goes against it. And I think these suggestions are fair and there should be conversation. We do it all the time as football fans. You know, what rule, what one rule would you change if you had a magic wand? You know, mine's always I'd get rid of time wasting. You get 10 seconds to take any kind of set piece. If you're any longer than 10 seconds, it gets reversed or the other team gets a penalty or I I, because time wasting really winds me up. Now that goes against the, the traditional rules of the game, but you're allowed to suggest it. And I just think the way people have scoffed at the idea I do think it's because he's American. If Todd Bowley was English and he suggested this, I do not think the backlash would have been as venomous um, as we have seen it. But viewers, um, what do what, what do you um, <laughs> what what do you think? I mean, I've seen a lot of Chelsea fans in the comments say how bad an owner uh, Todd Bowley is. We want him out of our club. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna say now. I think Chelsea fans have got to relax. I, don't, I think you're not handling the banter very well. I think you're not handling the the way the media is talking about your owner. And it's almost, I get it. It's, it's a lot easier to side with your enemy and the people coming for you to like avoid the embarrassment. I think Todd Bowley is going to build something very, very special at Chelsea. Um, I think they're going to build a very sustainable model. They're going to get some of the best people in the world in all departments running the football club. Just remember, like he's going to delegate so much of this out over the next year to 18 months. Just keep your powder dry and hang on because you start panicking now and you start set tweeting things and saying things, screenshots are coming. You know, you're going to, there's going to be receipts for your blasphemy uh, coming out in the future. I, I wanted to ask you, Ben, um, about um, Casado, because there's obviously been some comments that have come out from, uh, from sort of him and kind of admitting that it would be, uh, he would not be able to sort of turn down the chance to follow Graham Potter to Chelsea. Uh What's your understanding on Chelsea and Graham Potter pursuing him in January? Because it has been reported that there'll be another pot of money for Graham Potter come January. Is that correct? A pot for Potter. I like it. Yeah. I mean, there'll be a budget in January for sure. Just one final thing on Bowley very briefly is that I think the Chelsea fans and the general football community are also outraged or triggered because of the small amount of time that the new ownership group have been in at Chelsea, which is a really key point, because if Bowley was saying these things a year in, two years in, after Chelsea had qualified for the Champions League again, after there was some stability and continuity, it's a different story, because then you're listening to what Bowley is saying and juxtaposing it against an improved Chelsea or a stabilised Chelsea, and everybody perhaps then thinks, okay, 
we're still where we were when Abramovich was there. But that's a really key point that turmoil over the sale and then add to that the fact that Bowley has come in, he's changed the board, he's got rid of the manager, he's interim sporting director, and Chelsea are not playing particularly well and getting the results that they would like. So then when he's saying these ideas, I think that's why some of the fan base is a bit triggered because they're saying everything's moving very fast. And that unfortunately is just because there's a period of transition. And when you speak openly in a period of transition, fans rightly to some extent will be saying, surely you should have stuck with Thomas Tuchel for longer, or surely you should be focusing on getting results first and then wider strategy second. And I empathise with that point. I take that point. And then I think from Bowley's point of view, he's just hoping he can bulldoze through the transitional period and say in retrospect, you question me now, but look where Chelsea are in a year. So I think that's where the tensions come from. With Caicedo, not actually a player on Chelsea's radar under the old regime, but that could well change due to the fact that Carl McCauley and Graham Potter are now at Chelsea and they need a player really in that type of position. Caicedo actually changed agents mid-window and it's quite a problematic move as Liverpool found when they made inquiries. They were the club really in mid-August looking at Caicedo the most aggressively as I understand it but were not able to get a deal done and it was quite difficult when the agent changed to actually negotiate and finalise anything. But I do think that Caicedo would be open to a move to Chelsea, to Liverpool. And unfortunately for Brighton, if they're going to lose one in terms of their younger players, I think that him or McAllister will be the ones to go. I know there'll be talk about some of the slightly older players like Gross and Trossard as well. But I don't think Brighton will have a massive clear out. But I do think that Caicedo and McAllister are the two that are really under threat. And obviously, they would like to play under Graham Potter again. But not the number one midfielder for Chelsea. They'll be back for Edson Alvarez. He's the one that they really want to come in for. The player is very open. Todd Bowley has directly told Edson Alvarez that Chelsea will be back. So that's the first midfielder to watch as far as January is concerned. But Potter will have different ideas And that's what makes the dynamic, again, very interesting because come January, Bowley won't be the interim sporting director. Potter's got his own recruitment specialist. Potter will have his own notion of what Chelsea need because then he'll have been in the job for a bit longer. So then what does Bowley's word to a player in the latter part of the window mean comparative to a new sporting director and a new manager? And that, I think, is what's quite uncertain about Chelsea in the same way that Sterling looked furious when he was substituted and didn't necessarily like the role that he played against Salzburg in the same way that Aubameyang looked quite crestfallen speaking about the fact that Thomas Tuchel is not there anymore. And that's a problem for Potter to inherit because did he really want those players and did those players want to be there under Potter compared to Tuchel? And that's the mismatch really. If Chelsea knew that they were coming in for Potter, as I understand it, two weeks ago, then why did they proceed with signing a very Tuchel-like player in Aubameyang? And similarly, if Bowley wants a player, like, does he come in for Ronaldo again in January? Does he go back to Edson Alvarez, who he really wanted to push for? At what point does Potter get a say and say, actually, I would much rather have Caicedo versus Edson Alvarez? So there's a very interesting and intriguing and slightly unstable dynamic at Chelsea at the moment, despite their ambition that needs ironing out in January, which is why I think you can't rule out Caicedo to Chelsea. But make no mistake, now Potter's gone and his situation is a bit more volatile. I think in January, there'll be a lot of clubs chasing his signature because he's talented, he's young, and he's starting to play week out, week in, week out in the Premier League. Yeah, look, I think it's it's an interesting time. And I, I totally get the criticisms and I'm kind of going back to Todd B a little bit um, of, you know, he signed some players for Tuchel and then Tuchel moves on. I think people are missing the kind of, uh, and you explained it so eloquently this time last week, that th- th- I think Todd Bowley's done the right thing because it, it, in the end, because there's clearly a, a breakdown of relationship. I don't want to use the word trust, but direction, um, and the, the way the club is going to operate compared to what uh, Thomas Tuchel wanted, responsibilities. And what we, or I've seen, and I've seen Chelsea make this mistake in the past, Man United make this mistake, Arsenal make this mistake, is it's not working or there are problems. 
and you persist with that manager for another six weeks, another eight weeks, another three or four months, and you completely throw the season away. And I think that making the decision when they did w- w- was kind of key. Uh, and as uh, Hussain here, as a Chelsea fan, says, uh, Terry doesn't know what will happen, he's guessing. Uh, the way he says with confidence, don't worry, Chelsea fans, everything will be okay, and that Todd Foley will do well is so funny. He's guessing. But so are you if you say it's going to be a disaster. It's not guessing, it's an opinion. You're just obviously trying to diminish my opinion to being worthless by saying it's a guess. I feel that it's going to be okay because what Todd Bowley isn't saying is I'm going to remain as a sporting director and how it is now will continue this way. He wants to hire a manager and his team for long-term coaching and development of the the playing style. And he's looking to employ the best in class to run the football club. So for me, it's not a guess per se it's an educated guess at that if you if i bought a restaurant today i don't know how to cook food to the michelin star level i don't know how to run a restaurant but if i went out and bought in a michelin star level chef and one of the best um restaurant managers in the world and i employed them and paid them right i said right there you go you're running it you're being paid this there's a much there's a there's a big chance i'm going to create a successful restaurant <laughs> and that, that's for me why i can guess with with an with, with, with an air of um with an air of confidence that Todd Bowley will get it right at Chelsea. The owners will get it right at Chelsea with how much money they're pumping into it. And I think people have just got to remain um, calm there. But uh, viewers, you're entitled to your your opinions as well. How do you think this is going to go? Obviously, there is some uh, uh, pressure already on Chelsea. They've got to beat AC Milan in their next Champions League game. Otherwise, it's going to start to look pretty precarious indeed. But moving moving on and away from Chelsea a little bit, um, Arsenal, of, of course, have started the season well. Um, I want to ask you about a player who, a few days ago, um, I think about a week ago, stated that uh, Arsenal is a very good team, very good manager. I can, I, I would not be able to say no to Arsenal in uh, Mudrik. He obviously scored last night against Celtic, which has got the Arsenal fans' tongues wagging again. Is this a deal you expect to see Arsenal try and pursue in January, or is it very much a case of just the burning embers of the summer window kind of spewing over a good performance in the Champions League? And, of course, Arsenal's name are going to get linked. Well, Mudrick is on Arsenal's radar, but they never made a bid in the last window, but they certainly inquired about the player. And he's very open to the Arsenal move if they come calling. And there's a parallel almost between Mudrick and Yuri Tielemans in that respect, that Tielemans said very openly that he wanted Arsenal, but Arsenal never came in. And with Mudrick, he's now said on record to myself that if Arsenal make an offer, it'd be very hard to say no but Arsenal haven't moved. And one of the reasons why they haven't moved is because Shakhtar are asking for over 50 million euros and Arsenal's valuation is much closer to 30 million euros. And it may be in January that the interested parties are able to meet somewhere in the middle, but the challenge from the perspective of a prospective buyer is that if Mudrich keeps scoring in the Champions League and he's now two for two and his goal against Celtic was an absolute rocket, the price is only going to go up. And of course, if Shakhtar are to qualify for the knockout stages, they'll have Champions League football beyond January. And it might well persuade Mudrik to stay and then go in a year's time rather than in January. But Arsenal would still like a wide, creative-minded player, which is why they were originally in the race, say, for Rafinha and have looked at one or two others as well. And Mudrik is just a very strong talent because he can play on both sides. He's a left winger, but Mikel Arteta firmly believes that he could also move over to the right-hand side as well. He's very composed with his feet. He's fast, particularly his acceleration over short spaces. He showed that in the build-up to the goal that he scored. And he's just a natural finisher and full of assists as well. So there's a real opportunity for Arsenal if they come in for Mudrik. But there's a huge amount of interest. So Leverkusen would like him. Everton would like him. They're the club that had a 30 million euros bid turned down. Brentford have inquired as well. So it's certainly one to watch in January. But Dario Serna, the former Croatia right back who's sporting director at Shakhtar at the moment, also exclusively told me a couple of days ago, I put that article out online before the Celtic game yesterday, that A lot, a lot, a lot. He said it three times of money is required in order to sign Mudrik. So that's a consideration as well. And it's the reason really why Arsenal never advanced the situation in the last window, because they knew straight away that Shakhtar 
are not going to sell for 30 million, 35 million, 40 million euros at the moment. They want 50 million plus euros. And that effectively is pricing Mudrik out of the market for now. And if he keeps scoring, the price will probably be even higher come January as well. So I think there's a lot of excitement because people are now seeing his potential. But for now, Arsenal are not planning a bid. I think that's too strong in January. But what they are doing is monitoring the situation because they know that he's a top, top talent. And Serna may be over-exaggerated when he said that only Mbappe and Vinny Jr. in Mudrik's position are better than Mudrik at the moment. But I think what is fair to say is if he keeps working hard, he will be compared to those players in the long run. But he can't yet be spoken about in the same sentence as those two until, ironically, he moves to a big club. So that's the sort of paradox that if he's only at Shakhtar, outside of Champions League, anything he does won't be in the same breath as Mbappe or Vinny Jr. But if somebody pays up and takes him in January like an Arsenal and he plays regularly, then at that point, he's got the potential when he's a, a slightly bigger club with respect to Shakhtar to show what he can do. So I think that his potential is limitless at the moment, but to realise it, he has to move to a big club. But to do that, somebody has to pay big money. And Mudrik said that when he spoke yeah. to me, that if it was up to him, he would join a club like Arsenal or he would move to the Premier League. But it's not just up to him. And Shakhtar are firm at the moment that if they're to allow him to leave, they want that big price. And Arsenal and others like Everton were just not prepared to pay it in the last window. Yeah, look, I, 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 you're seeing that as well. With all the new money that's now in football, everyone is just expensive. And you, you've got Mudrik, very good young up-and-coming winger. You've, of course, got the, the... I say the emergence. Spurs fans knew who he was. Um, young um, Marcus Edwards, um, who, I mean, we I think we were, as football fans, denied one of the greatest Champions League goals ever the, the, the other night. But that one performance, you know... I mean, there's probably clubs already scouting him. But the fan attention on him now is going to be huge because he highlighted it in such a big game. And I think, you know, Mudrik last night, we, we were watching the game against Celtic and uh, in the studio, and it was a case of, well, let's see how good he is. And yes, it was some bad. I mean, ironically, it was a bad touch from him that led to um, Celtic's first goal. But you saw his qualities throughout the course of the game. And of course, Shakhtar's squad is, is nowhere near the quality that it used to be. And we know why that is. There's a lot going on in the nation that's just kind of changed their, their football club. But Certainly going to be an interesting one to see what happens in January or come the summer um, uh, su su surrounding him. It, it, it really, really would be. Uh, no, no doubt about it whatsoever. Um, I, want, I want to ask you about another big thing going on in football at the minute, um, aw away from Arsenal, really. And that's um, uh, towards M Manchester United in, in the sense of Jim Ratcliffe, a, a, a proposed bid that may be on his way that may be on its way in. You're kind of getting a lot of noises. Of course, Le Parisian, a lot of French outlets talking about he's working on potential backroom staff, the likes of Campos again. Um, what, what's your understanding of the latest round in Jim Ratcliffe and, and a potential bid uh, from him or, some, or from somebody else for Manchester United? Well, I think the first thing to say very clearly is that it remains an if, if the Glazers are prepared to sell. And there was certainly a feeling in the middle of the window that if they were to consider any kind of sale, it would be minority rather than majority. In other words, they still want to remain at the club in a controlling capacity. And I think that Jim Ratcliffe wants to buy the club 100%. And I don't see a dynamic where the Glazers and Ratcliffe coexist in any capacity. So Ratcliffe is very good at putting himself out there and at saying what he wants to do and what he wants and his ambition is not always the same as what he's being told he can do behind closed doors. So I think that the Glazers and Radcliffe have not engaged in the same way that Radcliffe's PR is suggesting. But what is very clear is that he would like to buy the football club. And when very late in the process, too late, when the current owners of Chelsea were already in exclusive talks to complete the acquisition and they were the preferred bidder. There was Jim Ratcliffe saying, here's a late offer. I can finance it. I've got the best part of four billion. And why, when it was a lost cause 
and Chelsea were not even engaging with Ratcliffe, was he putting again that PR out there? It was to show to the market that he's got the four odd billion, that he doesn't need any loans, that he can come straight in, that it would be a very simple sale, other than he would obviously have to resolve the situation at Nice and make sure that he could ultimately own two clubs at the same time as part of a kind of model. I don't think that there would be any issues there. And I also, to be honest with you, think in the long term, he'd be quite happy to sell up at Nice, even though he's very new to that particular yeah. football club. But with Manchester United, I think that it's Radcliffe once again just making sure that PR comes first. He's buying this football club through the media, not through the Glazers. And the Glazers are much like Mike Ashley when he sold Newcastle. They don't like everything coming through the media first. They want it secret. They want it silent. So it's very interesting that Radcliffe is forcing a platform through the media, whilst at the same time saying he wants to buy Manchester United. And to buy Manchester United, he has to have a plan. So it's natural that he would think about a Campos a sporting director, that he would line up various people because you've got to be able to walk into that football club and hit the ground running. And I think if the Glazers were to leave, there'd be a lot of holes, much like at Chelsea with Abramovich due to the sanctions. So it's very smart that he's putting a plan together. But I don't know how wise it is to be this aggressive, playing the media game and briefing and leaking all the things he's going to do at the club. I still don't know how the Glazers will receive that. So I would say at this point, it's very clear that his intent is genuine. But what is less clear is whether the Glazers will genuinely engage with him comparative to either sticking around, now things are stabilising at Manchester United, or looking for minority investment only. And if they look for minority investment only, then my feeling is still that they would prefer, prefer other partners and potentially American-led partners and businesses because mm -hmm. they'll know if they bring on Jim Ratcliffe only in a majority capacity first, that he's kind of a threat to their model and their positions. Whereas if you go for more of a business in America that they're used to working with and it's only minority investment, then I think everything under the Glazers would be on the same page. So I think it's quite exciting for Manchester United if Radcliffe can make headway. And he's obviously a Manchester United fan as well. But I think there's a long, long way to go still to persuade the Glazers to sell a majority stake or even a minority stake specifically to Sir Jim Ratcliffe. And the more he goes through the media first, the more I doubt that he's actually making any genuine headway. Yeah, it's it's, it's an intriguing one for me because I, it, it depends on who you speak to or you know, opinion based things I'm talking about here. There are some that feel that, you know, the amount of money that was spent last minute was almost like a, a last ditch attempt to get the t the club and the team into the best possible view for them to move on and sell. Of course, the majority of rivals, and you'll see it in our live chat uh, every time the, the the potential sale gets discussed. There's no way they're selling; they're 100 percent st staying. And I think, from a fan point of view, it's United fans that want it to happen are more optimistic it could. Rivals, that of course, don't want the Glazers to leave because rivals know that the Glazers are the predominant reason why we haven't been competitive for a decade. They are desperate for them to stay because why, you know, why would rivals want, from a footballing point of view, why would rivals want a good owner to come in and, and look after the club? And I see a bit of criticism there for, uh, for Radcliffe, Samuel Nisa, a low down in the league in the Uber Eats leagues. What has he done there? And that's a fair point. But you've got to remember with Man United, barring putting your own money in to physically buy the club, Man United is is pretty much self-sustaining in terms of the money they generate, what they can then spend on players, as long as you have the right people kind of running the operation, i.e. a little bit like Chelsea, you know, you need to bring in the right technical directors and the right board as an example. But look, I, I think, listen, I, I try anybody other than the Glazers right now uh, with, with, with where they've kind of left this as an example. So it's going to be intriguing, as you say, to see where this kind of goes um, for Man United. And the things have improved slightly. Uh, into, uh, on, on the football pitch, there has been some kind of progression in, in, in that regard. Uh, with Man United move, moving forward and improving, do you think that's because they've given this kind of control and power to to, to Ten Hag? And do you see it continuing? Because the, the criticism has always been that the new manager kind of gets power to begin with and then it's subsequently pulled away later on down the line. But so far, so good, I would say. 
Yeah, I think that nothing's changed at Manchester United and that is still the problem, that there is a foundational issue with how the football club has run. And it's very easy, we saw it under Solskjaer as well, when the club goes on a run to think everything's perfect. And then as soon as anything goes wrong, it isn't perfect. And that's the challenge that Ten Hag has, really, that he's coming off the back of now, I think, a relatively successful end to the transfer window, particularly with Anthony and Casemiro coming in. And the Ronaldo situation, as it has been for a couple of weeks, is much calmer. So he can finally, with the window shut and Ronaldo staying at least until January, focus on his football. And we know that he's a very good coach and he's got his methods and ways and he's tried to bring footballers to the club that fit into his philosophy. So what we're seeing is Ten Hag starting to stamp his philosophy on the football side. But if things go wrong, there's still players in that dressing room capable of creating disharmony. And there's still a board that can change things on a whim. So very impressed naturally with the win over Arsenal and over Liverpool as well. They ground one out away at Southampton. I thought they played pretty well against a poor Leicester side that are lacking in confidence. Good to see them get these 1-0 wins because those are probably games that when Manchester United at the beginning of the season or even in parts of last season approached, they would have conceded, they would have slipped up, they would have dropped points. So don't underestimate the importance of a sort of ugly 1-0 win against a Southampton side that played mm. well and then a Leicester side that weren't killed off but never really looked particularly toothless, sort of clinical in front of goal. They, they were toothless in the final third. So now it's a very key period for Manchester United because they play Sheriff and they need to respond after losing to Sociedad. And then they've got the Manchester derby coming up on the horizon as well because that Leeds game has been postponed. And can they make a statement at Man City? Can they win an away derby? Because they've had a lot of time to prepare for that in many ways now because the starting 11 in that game will not be the starting 11 against Sheriff and the same for Sociedad. So you could actually argue that, and I know they wouldn't have planned for this at the exact time, but you could make an argument that the September the 4th, I think it was, or third game, I think it was a Sunday, September the 4th, wasn't it, against Arsenal. That game, September the 4th, Palace postponed, Leeds postponed, and then you've got Sociedad and Sheriff. So then October the 2nd is, I believe, the Manchester derby. That's a month where you could basically say that you're starting 11 for that game. Now we'll have had a whole month. And it may be we see tonight because of that gap, more first teamers be involved in Sheriff. But you've basically got a month to prepare for an away Manchester derby. And I think that's key because that's a big run up. And how Manchester United perform, win, lose or draw in that game is very important. How have they spent that month? How have they utilised that time? Can they make a statement in that game? That, for me, is going to say a lot about Ten Hag and where Manchester United can go this season. If they turn up away from home in that game and get hammered, uh, they show Man City too much respect, and then they've got Europa League, and then they go away at Everton, then they've got Europa League again, then they've got tricky games against Newcastle, Tottenham and Chelsea. So things can be catalyzed from that Man City game, win, lose or draw, or they can fall to pieces once again. And that's when we'll see whether this is a long-term Ten Hag change, including the signings making an impact, or they're back where they were again at the beginning of the season. So that's what I'm looking at. And I think that it's just a quirk, unfortunately, due to the Queen's sad passing, that they've mm. had such a long run-up to this Premier League game now, regardless of the fact that they're playing in the Europa League. What impact is that going to make can they pull off what I think you would have to term an upset, especially with Haaland in so much form? So I'm intrigued. And I don't really have an opinion as to whether it will benefit Man U or not benefit Man U. But let me just reiterate that again, that Premier League game to Premier League game due to the postponements, United will have a whole month to prepare for an away Manchester derby. And I think that's significant. Uh, it, it certainly, certainly um, could be, there's no doubt. Um, Terry, tell them not to go to games or buy merch. I stand by that, my friend. Uh, if you want the Glazers out, stop putting money into the club. They will sell. It's my take. Um, 
And until people prove me wrong by pulling out their money and it doesn't make them sell, I'll stand by it as my opinion, my friend. Um, it, it's, it's, it's the way it works. You know, I work for a business. If everybody stopped reading it and watching it until I change something, you know, you know, it, it, it is what it is. A predominant reason why you haven't been competitive is because of poor management, not lack of investment. It depends how you view lack of investment. Firstly, poor management is derived from the owners. And I think if you actually listen to Man United fans, they don't ever moan about the amount of money spent on transfers. They bemoan the waste of money spent on transfers. As you've just said, the poor management of the football club and the fact the Glazers haven't spent one cent of their own money. Um, the club's still in the same amount of debt now as it was 17 years ago. And over one and a half billion pounds has been taken out of the club through dividends, interest payments, and much more. Those are the reasons why Man United fans are not happy with the Glazers. And if there's taken all that money out, but we have the best stadium in the world still, the best training ground in the country still, and we're competitive and winning, there'd be far less problems. But um, that's the nature of the beast. Um, but thank you very much. I, I wanted to ask you um, about um, uh, sort of... The, we were talking about 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 sort of Tottenham, what's going on on there at the minute? Uh, what, what's the latest surrounding them? Tottenham's just really interesting, isn't it? Because they had that poor loss away at Sporting by two goals to nil. We mentioned the Edwards goal that could have been, and let's not forget that he was a member of the Spurs academy as well. And I think they'll be ruining letting him go. To be perfectly honest with you. And they're just a bit hit and miss. They beat Marseille, they beat Fulham, they drew with West Ham, they won away at Nottingham Forest and they beat Wolves. So it's not exactly a terrible run and they got a good away point at Chelsea as well. And now I think they're heading into a very congested period where they'll play Leicester, they've got a good record. And then on the 1st of October, it's, of course, the North London derby. So it's a key stage, really, to see whether one the new signings can bed in. And I think as importantly, too, what are the roles of the new signings? Because with every signing that Spurs made, there was a huge amount of excitement. But then how many of these new signings are part of Conte's best 11? And does he know his best 11? So I think against Sporting, he played his 3-4-2-1. And there was off the top of my head, Davis, Dyer, and Romero at the back, Emerson, Hoiberg, Bentacor, and then Perisic, who I think will be a regular starter. Charleston got the start playing alongside Son, and then Kane was leading the line. And then you look at the bench and you see a range of other names like Langley and Spence that are all brought in. But you sort of feel that they're going to be bit part players, they're going to be depth players. And therefore, how strong are Spurs and how much of an impact have collectively the new signings made? Well, a big impact for depth, but not necessarily a huge impact in terms of the starting 11. So then with Arsenal's starting 11, and I'm talking specifically and only about starting 11s now, Arsenal's starting 11 is definitely stronger with the likes of Jesus and Zinchenko, and then arguably, if we're only talking about starting 11s, Chelsea's starting 11 is maybe the same or even weaker because they've lost Rudiger and Christiansen. And, you know, can you really say Lukaku is stronger in Chelsea's starting 11? Well, no, of course not. But you could say in a pure hypothetical, if he was at his absolute peak and he was happy, then is he better than a Broya or even an Aubameyang? And it's a hypothetical, like for like, peak for peak. But the Lukaku at Chelsea was not peak for peak. He was not a £100 million player. So Aubameyang makes Chelsea stronger than Lukaku. Broya probably even does because he just wasn't any good for Chelsea. And then you look at Man City and they clearly are stronger as a starting eleven. And Liverpool, if everyone's fit, it's hard to say because we don't really know what we're going to get yet from Nunez, but they're definitely missing Mane. So then coming back to Spurs, where are they now? Are they fourth like last season? Probably not at the moment. Arsenal are above them. I still think Chelsea are above them. Liverpool with everyone fit are above them. Man City are above them. And Manchester United are stronger as a starting eleven, in my opinion, too. So they might even be above them. So Spurs are in trouble in that respect. But the good news is their league form at the moment is good. And they're third in the table. Their Champions mm -hmm. League form, obviously, if you look at sporting, was bad. 
but they beat Marseille nonetheless. So I think this is just a really key period for us now. It wouldn't surprise me if by the mid part of the season, Chelsea, Liverpool and even Manchester United are above Tottenham. And that's obviously why, once again, much like in the back end of last season, the North London derby was absolutely pivotal. Spurs won it. They were phenomenal. Arsenal then went to Newcastle and lost and Tottenham had Champions League football. Now, I think the North London derby on the 1st of October is massive once again. If Spurs can go there like they did away at Chelsea and get a result, then they show that they're very capable of staying in the top four. But if they lose that game, they then got Frankfurt, they've got a tough game away at Brighton, they've got Frankfurt again, they've got Everton, and I think they've got Manchester United and Newcastle. And then by the end of October, you're like, right, now we know whether Spurs are stronger with their new signings or the same with their new signings. Now we know whether Richarlison is a contributor, is a squad player, or is a big money player that they've signed and isn't going to quite get the goals. So I don't really want to overly judge Spurs at this point. It's just an observation that I don't think all their signings have made them that much stronger. But mm. let's wait and see where they are at the end of October. Yeah, I kind of feel there's a bit of, when it comes to um, Tottenham, like, I think they're a really good team, as in they get results. It's not beautiful to watch. It isn't entertaining. Uh, we haven't really seen enough of their new signings yet. Richarlison just starting to, 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 to do what he's got to do. Um, but I also feel like they've been a little bit overhyped. In the summer, people talking about title contenders, 100% a guarantee for the top four. They'll cruise through their Champions League group. And I, I don't know if I buy into it buy into it that much in the sense of they're still Tottenham to me and Tottenham have still got to get over this mental hurdle they have, the, the kind of inferiority complex. And the as I, I always say about Tottenham, they always appear to me to be happy to be the bridesmaid. They're happy just... Some of their fans say, no, I want to win. But I feel like the general consensus is, oh, we're in the Champions League, though. As long as we're in it, we, we, that's, that's a success. And I feel like that's almost got to be blown away in the sense of unless you're winning it it's not a success like that's that's how winning clubs me mentality's got to be and i know that and and that's for me what's going to be intriguing because that's how antonio conte thinks in my opinion that unless you're winning you're, you're losing and that's a winner's mentality and i think spurs have got to kind of push the needle a little bit in that area to try and get themselves to that point but yeah it's, it's going to be it's going to be intriguing just to briefly i suppose defend them they've only scored 12 goals in the premier league right and when you look at their front line and not so much the new signings, but, you know, Kulisevic and Son and Kane and so on, they're going to score a lot more. So 12 goals is all right from six games. It's not the 20 that Man City have scored, but it's not a low number. But you look, for example, at Brentford have got 15. They're eighth in the table. Liverpool thrashed Bournemouth, so it's not that reflective, but they've got 15 and I think that Tottenham will score more. So then I look at the fact that they're third in the table. They've won four, drawn two, I believe. Same as Manchester City. They're one point off the top. They've not lost a game. And they've only conceded five in six games. Mm. And off the top of my head, I think it's only Wolves that have got a better defensive record so far. So that bodes well. Because if Conte gets Spurs keeping clean sheets, they will score for me either even more goals or they'll continue with this um, rough average of close to two goals a game or maybe slightly better. And then you start saying, well, great. So you can't fault their start in the Premier League for me. Everyone makes a lot of the sporting loss. But if you look at the table, if you look at the defence, if you look at the start that they've made in the league, if you look at the fact that they're one point off the top and they're third in the table, um, I, I think if you're praising Arsenal, from a purely Premier League point of view, even though maybe they're playing slightly more fluid, slightly more balanced football at the moment. But if you're praising Arsenal, I, I don't think you can not praise Spurs, unless, of course, you're an Arsenal fan, uh, because there's one point between the sides and Arsenal have lost a game and Spurs haven't. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I totally get that. And I, I just kind of feel like it's... Um... It's, it's Spurs is the weird one for me. It's like the transfer window. Like people were just overexcited about the deals they were doing, and I just I don't know. It's one. That, it's kind of a weird one to me. Like I saw Chelsea sign Kukurea and Kulabali and Sterling, and that's been met with that's mm, not really that good. And then Spurs sign Richarlison, Longley, Longley uh, and Basuma. And it's like, oh my god, have you seen who they bought? And for me, just as neutral to it as a United fan, I'm just looking at it and thinking Chelsea have signed the better players, but yet it's looked at as turmoil. 
Um, but maybe that's because there's a lot of transition going on and 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 we and we will see. Um, do you come back? Uh, I, I didn't go mad at you for saying that I was that I was guessing. Uh, my point was you've now said in the comments or I've seen, I want to address the audience here, that you also think you'll do well. So yeah, you're guessing, but you kind of said that I said it with too much confidence. Um, I don't know about you, but when I give an opinion, I give an opinion with confidence because it's what I believe. If I was given an opinion that lacked confidence, it would mean that I don't believe what I'm saying. Therefore, I wouldn't say it. So my thought, belief, belief is that Todd Bowley will make Chelsea a success. Um, we're all guessing because we're all given opinions um, based on what we know, what we don't know. Uh, that's it, my friend. But yeah, I'm not getting mad. I'm not having a pop at you. It's school communication. Uh, there we go, my friend. So if you were offended by that or upset, by me saying that I'm, uh, it's just a guess and I'm allowed to guess it's an opinion. Uh, I, I apologize, um, I suppose. But there we there we go. Um, I wanted to ask you about Haaland as well. Um, 26 Champions League goals in 21 games, th 13 goals in nine matches for, for City. He's currently tracking, if he keeps scoring at this rate, um, to score about 84 goals this entire season. If, he, if, if City play around about the maximum games they can. Um, We've never seen something like this on our shores in terms of this amount of goals this quickly for a team across all competitions. He's a little bit good, isn't he? Yes, he's a little bit good, to say the least. It's incredible, really. And actually, I think if you factor in all competitions that he could potentially be kind of involved in, then you'd put the goals even higher than the 80 that you said. I believe that the maths actually takes it to 100 and two goals in all competitions. But naturally, he won't be playing in every game and in every competition. But if you factor in every available game that he could play in with his current rates, then you find that he's scoring 1.86, I believe, goals per 90. And that means that across everything, he would be, by my maths anyway, at 102 goals, which is absolutely insane so there's no doubt he's superhuman and you look at that goal in particular the winner against Dortmund it had to be Haaland against his former club uh, and first of all by the way the pass was absolutely sublime that set up the goal but the placement of it I think would have nine strikers out of ten if not 99 out of 100 going for that with the head and Haaland had other ideas. And the way that he was able to adapt his body and make contact with it just shows you the intelligence and the use of the body yeah. and the instinct to get anything on the ball in any way. And I think that he's going to have a phenomenal season. I think that you cannot defend him when he plays like that. And he is going to score not only a ton of goals, but big and important goals as well. And let's not forget that Dortmund played really well in that game. Jude Bellingham opened the scoring. It took an absolute banger from John Stones to equalise. And then there was Haaland to win the game. And that was kind of just fate, I think. We didn't get the plot line with Lewandowski when he returned against Bayern Munich. But what we saw with Haaland is just that he's an alien. He's a freak of nature on the football field. And that's why Manchester City and many other clubs are tracking him. And it makes all the difference, doesn't it? Because Manchester City always had goals in them. That's the first thing to say. But now they've got a kind of breathing space almost. And by that, I mean that everyone will talk about Haaland's goals. And if he breaks records and if you're a fantasy football player, you're dining off that, right? But let's not forget that as a, and I've spoken to many teams about this, as a Premier League team defending Haaland, that's the big thing. You have to overcompensate. You have to double mark him. You're constantly aware of what he can do. You know that he can finish from all angles, from all areas, that he's a complete footballer. He's got absolutely everything in his locker. And as a consequence, you're having to invest more time and energy watching him and working out how to shut him out the game. And then unfortunately, there's a whole queue of other Manchester City offensive-minded players that can capitalise off that. So mm. suddenly he gives virtually everyone else that was already a huge threat 
even more space. And that's where I think a De Bruyne will benefit, a Foden will benefit, and so on. Or you say, yikes, I need to turn my attention back to those other players and yeah. then Harley has even more time and energy and space. And that's what makes Manchester City almost impossible to play against, that when they're at their best, you mark one, someone else capitalises. You don't mark one, Haaland continues to score. And I just don't think there's a solution. You almost have to say, OK, our game plan is to stop Haaland. And then if other players benefit and capitalise and score, so be it. And if you turn your attention away from Haaland and don't overinvest in terms of players and you don't try and shut him out the gate, then he's just going to keep scoring for fun. So there's no winning solution. And that's why I think Manchester City will win the Premier League and due to Liverpool's injuries, and even with Arsenal in good form, I think they'll cruise towards the Premier League. I'll be staggered, genuinely staggered, if we get to the final, let's say, three games of the season or certainly the last game of the season, and there's anything close to a Premier League race. I think Manchester City are going to get in the mid-90s as a minimum, and I can't see any other team in the Premier League getting 90 points or better, mm. which means if Man City find themselves, I think, in late April, in the mid-80s or high-80s by that point, I think that then they'll be Premier League champions with three games to spare. Yeah, I mean, it, it could be by even more than that. And just uh, the, the Harlan is just, as you say, he's not human. And the goal he scored last night, I mean, the way he got his foot, I mean, I've heard, you know, there's, there's a Spurs fan who comes on our show regularly called Patrick, who is like, oh, I'm not impressed with him. He just scores tap ins. I feel like just saying he's a tap in merchant uh, should be, like, Twitter should put that into their policies as being a block, a lifetime bannable offense. Like that should, I get like real, there's real abuse in this world that should be banned from from particular places, proper abuse. But then there's also like the abuse of people's intelligence through reading things like that. I, he's a tapping merchant. Because if tapping, being a tapping merchant was that easy, every every striker at City would be scoring at this rate all the time. It isn't. It's an instinct. It, 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 it's a brilliant skill which is very hard to quantify. It's hard to notice. And even if you just sometimes watch a city build up play and stop watching what KDB and whoever else is what they're doing on the ball and just watch his movement the way he'll like slowly drift round to the back post almost like a ghost nobody and you notice the defenders aren't even picking him up because he just does it so seamlessly and easily mm -hmm. and look barring injury I would almost like I was saying it last night in one of our shows I would kind of like him to break Messi's single season goal scoring record in, in terms not calendar year but single season and the reason I'd love to see him do that is just to see what the conversations around him look like. Because there's no doubt that, in my mind, I don't think he'll ever be considered a, as good a footballer as a Messi. I just don't think he ever will, because he doesn't possess all the, the tools that Messi has got. But in terms of a striker, you would be looking at the, the greatest season ever from a number nine in the history of European football at 22 years of age. And of course, if he scores that many goals, it's highly likely that Man City win multiple trophies as well. I just kind of want to see the conversation around it. I'm, I'm just intrigued because he does seem to me like a player, and I'm sure there's multiple reasons for it, who's just not, he's respected by many, but there's still this, maybe a 20, 30% population of the football fan base that just, they don't like him for some reason. And, I'm, and maybe it's because they prefer Mbappe. Maybe it's because they've got a star striker who they're worried about him kind of surpassing in his career. And we know rival fans always do that. You know, Spurs fans, I think, will end up hating Haaland because he'll be challenging the crown of Harry Kane, if that makes sense. They'll look for reasons to play him down. But yeah, he's been he's been phenomenal. He's been absolutely phenomenal. And um, I don't want it to continue as a Man United fan. But um, yeah, I think he's going to smash Mo Salah's record to absolute bits. I, I, I think he's going to he's going to do he's going to he's going to have a groundbreaking year this year. And he's already started. And you've got to think 20, no, no player in there, no striker in their first 21 Champions League games. Has had, has had anywhere near 26 goals. It's just unbelievable. You got to think he's already like past players like Crespo. He's already past mm -hmm. Robin Van Persie, who, you know, who played the majority of his career in the Champions League. I think he's all, he's at four goals away from Wayne Rooney. I think he's almost about to pass Didier Drogba. These are legends of our, of the European game. And he's, he's 22 and he's passing their goal scoring record in the Champions League. It's phenomenal. Phenomenal. Yeah. And I think the other thing is that, you have to just look at the type of player. So in basketball, to make an American analogy to trigger more fans in the chat after... Don't do it, Ben. Don't do it, Ben. Don't do it, Ben. 
<laughs> but if you look at say Steph Curry, we know that he's a distant shooter. There's plenty of others in the NBA that are either dunkers or spend their entire time under the basket and both contribute with points. And you don't get any more in terms of the tally when you score a goal, if it's a worldy or from distance versus from close range. So if you look at, let's say, Harlem versus Mbappe, then Mbappe does a lot more outside the box, does a lot more in the build-up play, gets into wider areas, contributes in a variety of ways, runs from distance and gets goals, surges into the box. And then if you look at Haaland, of course, the vast majority of his shots come from inside the box. But what that tells you is that he's staying there more often. So there you have a threat from close range that defenders have to constantly think about. And that allows the rest of the Manchester City players to do work that Haaland doesn't do comparative to Mbappe. And rather than having a debate over who's better, who's more rounded, who will contribute more, who would you rather have in your team? I would rather look at it as who would you rather have in your system? So when we say team, fans go, I want Mbappe at whatever club. But look at the system, look at the cogs. And that's what I love about Harlem, that you could get a player that's egotistical to the point where they want everything framed around them. And Haaland's definitely got swagger and ego, make no mistake about it. But it's just the fact that he fits so perfectly into what Manchester City do. So yeah. he might not have to really leave the box too much because he's just there to feed off the work that others do. And who cares if actually the build-up play, the pace, the running, the wide stuff was done by a De Bruyne or somebody else because Haaland's there to finish off Manchester City's hard work. Of course, he's also there to develop and do more and to contribute and will definitely, I think, see him get more of that in his game comparative to at Dortmund. But ultimately, why does he have to, if he's scoring goals, keep adding more and more and more? Because if he adds too much more, then he's going to find himself outside of the box and he's been brought in to score as many goals as possible. And then the other thing, as I have said in my first answer, is that you can't call him a tap-in merchant. It's hugely disrespectful. And you look at the Cruyff-like finish that won the game in the Champions League. That was not a tap-in. That was a player with intelligence who timed his run to absolute perfection from a world-class pass and then realised in timing his run to perfection that he had a choice to make between diving header or sticking out a limb in a controlled way. There was no luck to that finish at all. And he decided, because of his immense talent and his lanky limbs that gives him so much more reach, that that was exactly what he was going to do. He was going to go at it with a foot rather than with a head. And that tells you a lot of things about Haaland. I know it's only one goal, but it tells you that he is aware of what's coming. And it's quite difficult to be aware of that because when you get a pass like that from the outside of the boot, it's not always expected. And the fact that he was able to watch that, to stay on the defender's shoulder, to time the run perfectly, and all that means that he's not necessarily looking at the goal or the goalkeeper at that point because he's got a glance in his peripheral as to where the pass is coming from. And then as it comes in, and I know he's got a bit of time because it's quite a long pass from outside the area, to determine that flight of the ball, that he's not going to reach it with his head or he doesn't want to, and that he's going to go at it with his left foot on the volley is absolutely insane. Mm. and tells you a lot of his qualities and a lot of his intelligence and a lot of his timing. So, yeah, it's a goal from the box, yeah. much like virtually all of his other goals. But it's also his 13th goal for Manchester City in nine games. And if you look at Man City, who were free scoring last season en route to winning the Premier League title, I think they were averaging 2.26 goals off the top of my head across the whole season. Now they're averaging about 3.3 in all competitions, which means that Haaland has given them one extra goal. And if everything they had last season that won them the Premier League is enhanced with one extra goal, one Haaland goal, basically, in mm. every single game they play, then mark my words, Manchester City are unstoppable. Whether he's scoring in the box, whether he's tapping them in, or whether he's scoring crow flight finishes, it's irrelevant. If he is getting them one extra goal on top of what they were scoring last season, I'll say it again, Manchester City are unstoppable.
and that and that's the point there. This when people call someone like a, a stat padder, it's like, okay. That only really counts if City score a hundred goals on average per season. Harlan comes in and they still only score a hundred goals on average per season, and more are just being given to him. Then you can go, okay, the system's doing it. But if they're scoring more goals, he's adding something they didn't have before. And when you look at his Champions League record as an example, twenty six and twenty one, he's scoring one point two one goal sorry 1.24 goals per game good miller has got the second best goals to the game ratio who has a 97 90 uh, 0.97 he scored 34 in 35 you know you've got puskas who scored 36 in 41 you know you've got uh, uh, Stef- uh the, the uh, disfano who's got 49 and 58 Lewandowski is actually very very good and Messi is at 0.8 each you know if this guy played, if, if, if Haaland was able to play 100, this goal scoring ratio, if he played 158 Champions League games, the same as Lionel Messi, he would score nearly 200 Champions League goals. Like, I think people got to understand that he isn't just tapping in the odd goal in a game. He is scoring goals at a rate of knots that we haven't seen, that the last player at this age that was scoring at this frequency in all comps was R9. And no young striker in Europe, barring R9, has scored at this rate from this age. The only reason people, and I'm sorry if this offends you in the comments, the only people calling him a tapping merchant are uh, people with an ulterior motive, an ulterior motive to ensure that he doesn't, that they don't want him to be recognized for as brilliant as he is, whether it's one of their legends being surpassed, whether it's the kind of the new Messi versus Ronaldo debate, whether it's the new, you know, the, the, the Mbappe versus Haaland debate. That's the only thing that's making people play it down. And we do live in the era of football where we have a lot of eye test merchants who don't care about stats. I don't care about trophies. They care more about how a player looks and the individual player awards they might win. And it's the first time I think in football history, we've had this underbelly of fans that don't really care about the, the essence of the game, which is winning trophies, scoring goals, keeping clean sheets. It's all about how a player makes them feel or how a player looks on the pitch. And Haaland doesn't look that great. He's not, he doesn't, he's not aesthetically pleasing on the eye, uh, but that isn't what football is about. about. This isn't, listen, the likes of, um, uh, Jeremy Lynch and that over at F2 Freestyle. That's that's for you eye testers. Go watch the freestyle footballers. Leave us football fans to watch proper football. That's what I say. But uh, there we go. Um, t- Terry, blame the parents. I do blame the parents. I think it's all, it's all on the parents. I'm only joking. I'm only joking. Uh, rivals will be rivals. Why do you care what people think about a player? Um, if I didn't care what fans think, feel, and say, there's no point having a fan channel. Uh, that, that's why Hugo, like you're a, you're a member of the fan channel. Caring about the opinions and debating those opinions is literally why we exist. If every fan channel woke up today and went, we no longer care about the opinions of fans, we'd all have to shut down. <laughs> That'd be weird, my friend. That'd be very, very weird. That's why we do it. Um, Ben, always a pleasure to speak, my friend. I know we've run a little bit over today. Uh, do me a big, big favor, uh, viewers, and smash the like button before you leave and subscribe to the Football uh, Terrace. Um, and we'll, we'll speak... Um, I assume uh, this, uh, ne- next week, some point, Ben. Um, well, maybe the week after when the international breaks over. Um, see what's going on. I know you take a little bit of a break yourself, and and we'll speak again soon. I look forward to it. And by then, who knows? Harlem might have another twenty goals. <laughs> <laughs> this is my favourite comment. I watch. I watch football. I watch to enjoy football. Harlem contributes nothing valuable to the enjoyment of the game. Yeah, the match-winning goal last night was not enjoyable for Man City fans. Um, yeah, that's that, that's it. Maybe as a neutral, again, as a neutral, you're not going to like him either because he's going to score goals that make a team that you don't want to win, win lots of games. So I do get it. I do get why your enjoyment is taken out, but uh, maybe. Uh, listen, until next time, everybody, take care. Goodbye. God bless. And we'll see you all again very, very